Hi everyone, it is November 11, 2022. It's Singles Day for the whole world and let's discuss what just happened in last night's Monster CPI Rally. So let's go ahead and begin. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, how to manage risk when your CPI comes uh, less than expectations at 77 causing a massive short covering rally. You've got the QQQs up 7.5% in a single day. Let's go. So this was the snapshot of the market last night. You could see that almost every stock in the indices were actually up with big gains. You've got Apple 9% up, Microsoft 9% up, Google 7 Amazon 12 Tesla 7 in general, there's a lot of stocks that were even up 20, some names even going up 50% overnight. So you've got your Dow Jones up 3.7%, up 1,200 points. You've got the NASDAQ up 7.5%, 760 points. You've got S&P 500 going from 3,756 to 3,956, up 5.5%, and is actually looking to even pierce 4,000 and hitting for 1 or 4.2 tonight or not tonight, but next week. You're seeing your semiconductor bulls up 30%, the retail bulls up 23%, biotech bulls up 23%. You've got the QQQs, the longs there, the indices up 20%. You've got consumer discretionary bulls up 20%. China bulls are up 17%. China internet bulls up 16 Financial bulls up 15 your ARC ETF had the best day ever, up 14%. Your ARC financials, up 12%. Mean stocks were up 11% as a group. Genomics, biotech, up 11%. you have got a lot of internet names, up 9 Clean energy names, up 9%. Even the metaverse names were up 9%. Your solars were up 9 And even your crypto, despite implosion, even that sector was up 8%. So all of it is actually a short covering rally. Let's just go ahead and watch how each individual stock uh, went up last night. Starting with Upstart, it went 27% up last night, opening already up more than 15% and closing more than enough to close near the highs. So Upstart went 1850 to 2180. Wix.com up 20%, closing at $83. Your The Trade Desk had a 20% move overnight from 43 to 49, closing 47. You've got Weight Watchers International up 20%, Shopify up 20%, closing at 36.50. You've got AMC up 18%, Matterport up 15%, NVIDIA, which reports numbers next week, up 15%. Solar Edge up 14%. Take note that Solar Edge was just 210 when the when the when the week opened, and it's now nearing 50% for this week. Snapchat up 12%. ASTS Space Mobile up 12%. You've got Amplitude for uh, 14, closing at 15, 12% up. DoorDash up 20, uh, 11%. Expedia up 11. Bed Bath and Beyond up 10%. Back Holdings up 10%, Roblox up 10, Pintuatua up 8, Netflix up 8, GameStop up 7. Everything last night was an outlier move. Let's take a look at your software names. You've got Magnite rising 65% last night. So from about just 5 or 6, it's now nearing $9. Uh, it's 9.6. You've got Cloudflare up 25% overnight from about less than 40, now trading at 48. You've got Elastic up 18%, MongoDB up 17%, PagerDuty up 16, Twilio up 16, Zora up 15, Snowflake up 15, Zoom Video went from 71 to 82, up 15, UiPath up 12, Viva Systems up 10, JFrog up nine, Pinterest up nine. From the solar group, let's just go through it. Take note that just last two weeks ago, Sunrun was just near $20. Now it's up 50%, $30. It's up 27% last night. Sun Power is up 20% last night. 
now trading at $22.50. You've got f -Cell now trading 19% up at $3.50. Bloom Energy is now $21.7. Ballard Group up 16% at $6. Plug Power at $17. Blink Charging at $13.7. Solar Edge is 282. Your end phase is 309. You've got Active 109. XPEV Neo Lee Auto also rose uh, about uh, 8, 9, 10%. Charge Point up 11. Clean Spark. Even companies that are assumed to be bankrupt are up 10%, like RC Moto. <clears throat> Even in the e commerce names that have no revenue. So everything was just going up. Cats and dogs, the junkier they are, the more they've been rising. Farfetch up 20%, Jumia up 18%, Laser.com, it was up, uh, Luminar Laser, it's up 16%, Lighter Firm is now 8 bucks. Peloton went $10, Etsy is now $110, Shake Shack is $51, Sunworks uh, $2.25, Plug $17, Rivian $33, Bloom Energy $22, Sun Nova $23, Sunrun $30. You've got Unity rallying 30% last night. Fintech firms like Affirm, Buy Now, Pay Later is up to 20% uh, towards 15 bucks. Your good RX went from below 4 to uh, uh, near 5, uh, up 20%. Kupang is now trading at 20 bucks. Hydro Farm, your uh, vertical farming uh, is now uh, hydroponics. It's now up 20% uh, to $2.50. Bill.com is about 120, Skills 108, Stakeholder Foods, which is actually meat tech. So uh, that's 3D printing meat. It's up 17%. You've got Asana up 17% at 18. Lemonade, $20. Dada, 360. Snowflake, near 150. AI, 13. Seren, 17. Take note, though, that despite these monstrous gains, a lot of these names are still down 80, 90% year to date. Some names are down 70%. Biotech, amazing moves overnight. You've got Envite, 36%. GoodRx, 23%. Uh, just, we just need to actually read through it. So IBRx, Nanquest, PacBio, Novavax, Beam, Teladoc, Editas, Bingo, CRISPR, Iova, Intelia, Semaphore. You could see that all of these names have gone up 8, 10, 15, 30% overnight. How about Chinese names? Tonight, you've got, uh, yesterday it's been rallying. Tonight, you get another follow through on Chinese names. Your Chinese names are up anywhere from 10 to 20% from the likes of Neo, Dada, Yin, KC, your Billy Billy. You've got um, Momo, Tiger. Actually, the worse off they are, the more in they're in the live streaming areas, the more they have been rallying with Kwai Show and Billy Billy rallying 20% overnight. Um, as for advertising names, you got Magnite and Digital Turbine, 65% on your uh, programmatic advertising names, 60% overnight. Um, you've got uh, every streaming name up. You could see that uh, the more blue chip they are, like AT&T, Walt, Dis Walt Disney, and Comcast, those were just rallying 2 to 4%. But the big guns were uh, the big uh, down... The big beaten down names like Roku and uh, Fubo or AMC, they were up 15, 18% overnight, a function of a lot of short covering. So the, we've read about these uh, uh, ETFs going up 10, 20, 30% overnight. E-commerce names. So other than Jumia, Farfetch, you've got Wayfair rallying nearly 30% overnight, Kupang. Uh, take note, though, that the bigger the rallies last night, the worse off their fundamentals actually are. So uh, that was a bit of a huge junk led rally. R restaurants, the same thing could be said. So one group hospitality, a lot of your steakhouses have been not reporting good numbers, rallying 20, near 30%. You've got Beyond Meat, 20% up to $14. Dutch Bros up 22%, now 36. One group hospitality is up 26%, $6. Celsius even went as high as $100, so it was uh, approximately 20% up last night, uh, closing at 90. Oatly was up 20% as well, nearly 20%, uh, 12% up. Kura Sushi traded at $72 after bad numbers. It's down 10%, so you're seeing a lot of volatility. CMG was up 7%, nearing 1.5. Ruth Chris, which is your steakhouse, uh, up 10% overnight. Sweet Greens, Shake Shack, Milk Tea Shop in China, 
So um, as you can see, all these uh, fine dining uh, restaurants are rallying 10 to 20 to 30 percent. I remember about the meme uh, that is really like this, wherein uh, somebody was so happy about yesterday's move. Take note that Kathy Wood's ARK ETF had just headed for the best day ever last night as risk assets surge. Take note the following things, though. Every time you have a very good day in the market, in the Dow Jones, there was a time when it rallied the top 10 trading sessions. The 15% daily range of the Dow happened in March 15, 1933 then followed by October 6, 1931, also in the 15% range. October 30, 1929, you had a 12% index daily range. September 21, 1932, it was another 12% daily range. October 1308 and October 2808, when Lehman Brothers actually filed for bankruptcy, you had a 10 to 11% range. October 21, 1987, during the big crash, it was also a 10% daily range. Feb 11, 1932, August 3, 1932, December 18, 1931, these were 9.5% daily ranges, which shares to us that all of these uh, big numbers daily ha actually happens in big bear markets. What you can infer is that 1929, 1932, 1987, 08, all of these were recessions. And if you take a look at the largest one-day increases furthermore, other than those 15% largest one-day increases in the NASDAQ, in the Dow Jones, in the S&P 500, all of them do happen in a bear market, save for this uh, March 24, 2020, when you actually had a Fed pumping money, printing money during last 2020 COVID. Other than that, most of the... And then here in 2009, this was a quantitative easing, which was not a bear market. Today, if you would argue last night's rally on CPI, there was no change when it came to monetary policy. We still do have Fed rate hikes and we still have actually a tightening macro environment. And so we could argue that we are still in a bear market and the largest one day increases both in the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 is indeed a function of bear market rallies. Now, in terms of the subsequent performance, November 10, 2022, we can take a look that if you do take a look at the one month, three months, six months, 12 months, almost every name 12 months tells you that it will eventually bottom out. But over the one month, three months, six months, some people could say that in the very next month, you could see a mix of red and green. In the next three months and six months, it could get better. However, these data points do not actually show to you the big depth, the, the depths of our market today. Let's go through the best daily gains, the best day ever of the Dow. Inside those 10 best days, you could see that what was the inspiration. On March 15, 1933, this was markets reopening after FDR's bank holiday. Franklin D. Roosevelt shut down the banks on March 5. It was a one month long. U.S. banks were all closed. And when both markets and the banks reopened, investor confidence skyrocketed, pushing the Dow Jones up 15%. So we could argue that 15% rally on a day was a result of just markets being closed and reopened. Next, October 6, 1931, Hoover's attempts to restore confidence in the banks. President Herbert Hoover attempted to restore confidence in the U.S. banking system with a plan with, to deal with the solvency and security of the banking system. This included a $500 million fund providing liquidity to weak banks, expanding the Fed's mandate, creating land banks, the predecessors to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. This pushed the Dow Jones up 15% during the session, but this was not enough to stop the Dow Jones downward trend. On October 30, 1929, a 12% rally. This followed after the Black Monday. So this was a Black Tuesday. You could see that the Black Monday and Black Tuesday, the Dow Jones crashed more than 12% and then immediately followed with a Black Thursday and Black Monday. These three dates are considered to be the first taste of the great crash that followed. On October 30, 1929, John Rockefeller Sr. attempted to reassure investors stating that there is nothing in the business situation to warrant the destruction of values that has taken place on the exchanges during that past week. They've been buying stocks that day, and so the Dow Jones rose more than 12%. However, as you will know, 
the Dow Jones lost more than 80% thereafter before bottoming in 1932. During these days of rallying, actually the great plunger, the Mr. Jesse Livermore made $100 million during these 1929 to 1930 plus crashes. Okay, so um, you, you, you now know who to bet upon. Now, September 21, 1932, Farmers get a helping hand. This was an 11% rally in a single day. The Dow Jones rallied after news that Reconstruction Finance Corporation was going to expand authority to aid farms. Now, you can understand that this was um, to help not just farmers, but also railroads and companies all the way up until World War II. So um, this was emergency loans in, in case the banks were to fail. So it's more like a plunge protection towards the bank or more like a bailout. On October 13, 2008, central banks came to the rescue, another 11% daily move. So this rally was spurred by a central bank intervention worldwide, a coordinated campaign to improve liquidity in the financial system, providing billions of dollars for troubled banks. Now, in October 08, investors thought that stocks were cheap, only to know that March 2009, it would be cheaper. Nonetheless, this rally gained 10% overnight. There was no single catalyst for this surge, except that the market and the investors were just expecting that the Fed would cut interest rates yet again. This sounds similar to nowadays, where the CPI inflation made people think that the Fed would pivot next year. Now, um, on October 21, 1987, two days after Black Monday, another rally, as we saw, on only just two days after the worst crash in history, that was a 22% down day in the index on the Black Monday. The index rallied also trying to recover that lost session. Fear over computerized trading programs abated, pushing the Dow Jones up 10% in a single day. So we are seeing really a lot of volatility during these bear crashes. On February 11, 1932, the Secretary of Treasury resigned. Andrew Mellon submitted his resignation. He was very unpopular during the Great Depression. He advised Hoover to liquidate labor, stocks, farmers, to purge the rottenness out of the system. When he was uh, resigning, the market and the investors were thrilled. So this is similar to, let's say, Jerome Powell just resigned and people actually felt that Fed would get a new Fed chairman who was probably going to be dovish. So nowadays, we haven't seen Federal Chairman Jerome Powell actually resigning and he seems to echo more of a Paul Volcker, which doesn't make it seem likely that this 10% uh, days could actually happen. Now, on August 3, 1932, the Secretary of Commerce resigned. That same day, Secretary of Commerce Robert Lamont announced his resignation and the bullish market momentum began creeping back into the market for nearly a month. December 18, 1931, markets bounced back on rumors 9%. This kind of uh, reminds you of China's reopening rumors, which was just uh, confirmed today. Your Dow Jones here rallied 10%. Investors became very hopeful as bankers had a loose jointed agreement to buy stocks at bargain prices in an effort to move the market in a positive direction. You're noticing that all these best 10 days were intervention and coordinated by the market. Nowadays, though, we can only surmise that the market rallied last night on the hopes of a Fed pivot, not necessarily of an actual Fed pivot. Now, let's just go and take a look at a lot of data points here. So um, in a short-term bear market, some of the most explosive moves have been happening. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, 16% moves, but all of them happened in a recession, which actually tells us that last night, 7.5% market really uh, confirms that we are in a bear market, save, uh, save for the fact that here in 1987, after massive resignations, it did inspire a short-term bull market the next years after. 
So, but that said, all of these are uh, 1946, 1939, 1929, 1907, 2008, and 2022. These types of movements are reminiscent 99% or 90% of bear markets. Now, the S&P 500 post bear market bounce, if you are bullish uh, happening from last night, the data does tell you that we could bottom out in the next year and the next 24 months. So whatever is happening in prices today, it is highly likely that if you wait one year or two years, then you could get that big bear market bounce. So these are where some people's hopes are going, uh, are coming from. 1949, if you have the bear market ending, it did rally, 1957, 1962, and so on. 2001, 2002. However, we may actually still be in the year 2000 NASDAQ era. Um, here are your bear markets. An average recession does have a start date and end date uh, lasting more than uh, 10 months. So your average median drop is also 28 or 30%, which the S&P 500, however, hasn't met. Because from 4.8, for a 30% drop, we do have to fall to about 3.5, 3, 3.2, 3, 3,000 just to get to the median. So here you list all the S&P 500 bear markets with more than 20% going back to as much as 1929 or more than a hundred or over a nearing 100 years you do have an average drop of 35% an average 10 month drop so um you do have at least a year uh, or well um, if you would assume that november the bear market ended the only problem is that we haven't uh, sufficed this 35% drop yet maximum drops have happened uh, of about 60% drop within a year Minimum drop is 20%. So whether we have 20 or 60, or was that enough? Even if you think that we have a mild bear market, it still means 4,000 end of year, which means that last night's rally, even if it would go up yet again, could actually have at most 1% to 5% rallies uh, and will have a lot of gridlock and a lot of uh, tug of war in the 4,200 arena. So um, you have a lot of people still using an S&P 500 3-2 consensus that is due to 100 years of data. So just try to stay seated in this roller coaster. We still have a bumpy road. And if you are short predicting the SPY 3-2 next year, I would say that you have to be patient and have enough cash to handle the drawdowns. Take note that most people see markets uh, starting from corrections and then heading to a big down bear market. This was true on October 2007. This was true on March 2000, where you were dropping 40% only to fall furthermore, 2001, 2002, 2003. That would be your NASDAQ bubble, a four-year bear market. On October 07, you had 08, 09. We only uh, bottomed out three years after. On August 1987, also three years after. November 1980, three years after. We sh we Because of these data, our viewpoint, historically speaking, is that we would bottom out somewhere in 2023, 2024, or 2025, considering that if we really peaked around 2021, we still have about two years to go before we really bottom out. So your deal activity usually spikes ahead of market peak. We know that the market deal activity spiked in 2021, specifically February and March 2021. And jobless claims have also been a reason why you haven't been seeing the bear market extreme because jobless claims begin to climb, which continues to be uh, something to look at on the unemployment. When does the bear market, what does the bear market look like? It does look something like this, wherein about two years or one and a half years, you do have the S&P 500 declining more than 56%, which is why a lot of people don't just assume a 3,200 in the SPY. Some are arguing 2,4 at the very least. So since the average of the bear market rally can be misleading, we do have to caution everyone that these are guides and not certainties. Obviously, melt up is happening and uh, we could technically make up a melt up towards 4.4 or 4.5. Nobody knows the future. Anything is possible. But as long as the market keeps pumping, for sure, the shorts are drowning. So if you choose to be 100% in cash with all this volatility, I wouldn't blame you just because of what happened overnight on CPI. 
Now let's give a lot of scenarios here. A lot of bear market rallies last for as little as a week for as long as three months. Gains usually are about 8% and can be as much as 20% or more. So how do you distinguish a bear market rally from an actual bull market? It's very hard to say this, although these are things that can be inferred. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and yet expecting different results. The so-called Fed pivot, however, is something that the market likes to continue sharing as a rumor so that the market can actually uh, recover from very tight environments. However, from constant Fed speeches, they did say that they will keep at it. And so this insanity of this uh, bear market rally continues to be still in the fundamentally wrong side. Now, of course, technically we could continue bouncing, but take note what happened every time there is a Fed speech by your Jerome Powell. Here recently, as early as November 2, 2022, just one week ago last Wednesday, we were rallying at 3.9 and forcibly fell down all the way to 3.750. And so the current rally was just back towards this Fed pivot discussion uh, where the Jerome Powell actually poured cold water on it. Now, these are, as, as you can see, from 4.8. As of June 2022, we fell 3.750 towards 20%. An average 20% decline would mean that we have to go back to 3,750, which means that we have to negate everything that happened last night. That said, will this happen for, uh, for the next couple of weeks or months? Well, it seems like we have a year, uh, another month to go. And um, it seems like the data tells us that if we are in a bear market, this 3750 year end uh, is still uh, something to watch out from for the for the people who think that this rally is going to be sustained. At the same time, the average bear market decline, as you could see, comes from 20, 30, 27, 48, 57. And if we were actually to close this year at uh, at just uh, 4,000, that would mean less than a bear market where theoretically we are having worse numbers than the past. So risk management, so how do you manage the risk? My answer here is assess how high this goes. Now, history will tell us the market rallies can go 20%, and so a melt-up scenario from current bottom of 3.5 means a further 5% rally in the S&P 500 towards 4.2, considering last night's close on S&P is 3.950. Market could go for two, but short interest will build up going back to 3.8 or 3.5. Eventually, it will be a waiting game. So my sense is that your, your next uh, drop would likely happen during the Fed meeting, which is uh, slated already on December 14. So key conclusions is that if you think you can tolerate the S&P 500 hitting for two, if you have shorts, then just keep your shorts. This is one of the reasons why I did keep my shorts. Because I figured I can handle the SPY hitting for two. And even if drawdowns happen, I will tolerate that since a lot of market contagion risks are still large and current debt and leverage risks continue to be evident for an illiquid insolvency. Now, if you think you cannot tolerate S&P hitting for two before it goes down, then nobody knows also if we will get there or if we won't. You can stay in cash and then short again at your most convenient time. Either way, since 2022 is a bear market, we have high probability that we will not close the year end at 4.2. And with the bear market minimum de definition of 20% or more declines, we can widely acknowledge that we can close this year end by 4,000 or less. Either way, if the maximum pain on short is tolerable, hence kept the shorts. This is your S&P returns after major peaks. Your year 2000 to 2002 shows you we are far from uh, infant. This, uh, this bear market is still infant and we have a lot of leeway to go. Your black line here is us, 18%. We haven't even dropped more than 20% in your S&P 500 after that big rally. This is your 2007 and 2009. We could rally further only to drop a 50% decline from here to here. Now, this is your 2020. That was the very sharp uh, sell-off, which was also just COVID. And that was the shortest bear market in history, which proved to be not a bear market given how much the Fed pumped prime the economy. So there was the trillion of fiscal stimulus here, which prompted our current inflation. 
bear market rally since 1928, you've got 96 times uh, rallies between 5 to 10. So far, if we were to consider current rally of over 10, there has been 41 rallies that happened of more vicious rallies with an average rally length of 20 days. Today, though, we are, we are already overextended with a 13% rally with more than 21 trading days and 29 bars, meaning 29 uh, days that we rallied. <clears throat> So you have another op. We have, uh, as we said, you have option one, go 100% cash, or option two, wait things out. Widen stop losses, anticipating maximum rally points towards 4 2. And you have to check all past vicious bear market rallies on how strong and fierce these things go. Bear market rallies are a treacherous lure. These rebounds, however, are best left to traders who can move fast. So these are, again, let's look again to those uh, bear market rallies. Year 2000 to 2003 is the most closely watched peg here. This is your 19% rally here, only to fall a noteworthy 60% the next year. So this is us, year 2000. Either we are here on that, actually we are, we are finished on that 9% rally, so we may be here in the 19%. Although this 19% rally, we also finished last uh, June 16 till about August 16. So we had that two-month rally of 20%. We're still somewhere here, whether we rally, uh, whether we go down 60% or we rally further before dropping back. So this is your 2001 peg and 2002 peg and 2003 peg. The further off we go down, you have bigger rallies or bigger squeezes of 20% or more. Here, 20%, here, 20%, here, 20%. Hope springs are eternal during the GFC or the global financial crisis of the bear market. You could see that during September to December, there was an 8% rally here, which quickly fizzled out to more than a 12% drop and another um, actually a 50% drop as well, uh, going back from uh, October to March. So be careful because uh, although we can rally, uh, the big drops are bigger than the rallies. And then, of course, um, these are your O9, um, whether you are going to drop 80% furthermore or 35%, that is um, really the, the big drops that are still scary to watch out for. Dead cat bounces in 2000 to 2002. So these are your rallies, 21%, drop 8, up 8, down 32 we might be actually here in the up eight. This, uh, we're now already up 13 since the recent drop. We could rally further, as I said, another 5%, only to have uh, only to fall even more. So be careful on these dead cat bounces. Here we are, S&P 500. We're now 3956. Going to the maximum pain, 4.2 is somewhere here, um, we, which means that we would rally all the way 20% up for another 6% up on your S&P 500. Now, of course, as uh, Dow Jones keeps on rallying, some of the older ones like Jamie Dimon have been cautioning about these vicious bear market rallies and keeping all of them on edge. And they are actually advising cash. CEO Dimon warned S&P 500 could drop towards 3,000 area or 3,002. And um, I think that it would be good to actually watch for these uh, warnings as well. Let's spot the excesses. Um, during the market cap of end year 2009, this was the blue line. Equities was at 10 trillion. However, as of year end 2021, we actually had a 5x move to 50 trillion. Real estate also uh, went from 30 trillion to 70 trillion, which necessitates actually prompting people to say that these excesses are even worse than the GFCs. Your government bonds actually was excessive from less than 10 trillion to over 20 trillion. Private equity from less than 5 trillion to more than 10 trillion. Your gold, your corporate bonds, cryptocurrencies, SPACs. So you're seeing that there's just too much excess liquidity in equities and real estate. So stocks and houses have a lot to crash further on. Long drops, S&P 500 index decline usually takes more than a year. For 1929, 678 days, 1937, 267 days, 1946, 760 days, 1956, 300 days, 1961, 135 days, 
1966, one, six, seven days. You can see that 1987 was one of the shortest or uh, slow, uh, smallest draw uh, uh, length in number of days. But that also had the steepest uh, steep drops of 34 percent. 1990, 62 days, 20 uh, drop. Nowadays, um, we are averaging 300. Uh, so the average is 318 days or roughly more than a year with a 38% drop. This year, actually, because of last night's rally, we are um, still less than 20% drop, and uh, we are uh, still about 11 months in the making. Bear market decline is uh, at risk of um, having further uh, drops because of all of these data. Now, how many people are expecting a rate cut or a Fed pivot by the end of next year? So as of this year, a lot of people have been saying very little, uh, uh, very, very few people actually believe a Fed pivot. Now, a lot of uh, some people actually believe a lot of them believe more than 50 percent believe second half of 2023 or others believe first half of 2023. Others even believe it's going to be first half of 2024, whereas very small people are also discussing even later than 2024. This was a survey conducted around July 18 to 2022, uh, wherein the question is, when will the Fed announce the next rate cut? So if we're going to just look at the wisdom of crowds, uh, despite the CPI actually at 7.7, .7, a lot of people believe that this inflation will remain sticky and high, which means that even if inflation goes down from seven, uh, from eight to seven to even to four or five, it's still going to be very high, which means that the Fed will keep your interest rates pretty, uh, pretty much at 5% over the next uh, first half and second half of next year. So um, a lot of people are actually assuming a bottom around uh, between March to June, July 2023. The 2023 is also looking bleak. A lot of people believe that a recession is at hand next year and that the market definitely does not bottom out until recessions actually are there. So six months after recession, that's when most people actually believe a bottom takes place. Asian economies are seeing that uh, probability. Um, actually, these might actually have had the change since um, a lot of the UK is also uh, a lot of uh, developed markets like Japan, uh, so you're seeing actually a lot of uh, recession probability risks all over the world. Markets are priced for inflation to come back down very fast, peak risk. So actually, since August, when we were rallying at about 4.3 S&P 500, the market was actually anticipating that the Fed would peak, uh, inflation would peak, and therefore the Fed funds would have to ease out. Eventually, we saw that the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell, quashed all those uh, anticipation of Fed pivot. He threw cold water to this, which actually went from 4.3 to about 3.5. So uh, careful about uh, Fed and don't tempt Fed. Bazaar, which is Credit Suisse, has also said that L-shaped recession will be uh, the peg for, uh, for us to conquer inflation. An L-shaped recession means a longer duration uh, recession, which means that it doesn't end uh, very quickly. L-shape takes about year, uh, years and years. So we have the 2000 to 2003 peg for this. And take note that economic war are also inflationary and structural. We have a shortage in uh, your oil supply. The U.S. Uh, has, a, has an SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, already getting drained from more than 600 million barrels. Now it's just 250 million barrels. And you've got China reopening just confirmed uh, from their zero COVID stance, which means that oils, uh, oil plays will go up and inflation will continue to remain high. Now, the shortest recession, which was 1960s, one of them, only lasted for 10 months. Um, however, if you take a look at unemployment, uh, this was here. It was uh, unemployment rising. You could see that nowadays unemployment continues to go up with massive layoffs in tech. So um, it, it seems like we haven't peaked in the unemployment rate to say that we have bottomed out. Uh, as your unemployment continues to go up, it means that you haven't peaked. So um, your unemployment today is about four or five. It could go seven, eight, nine. So um, we haven't peaked. Structural bear markets compared to 1973, 2001, 2007, 2022, it's still going to take quite a while. If, we're, if it's going to be an L-shaped recession, the minimum is about 400 to 500 business days 
which means, guys, roughly uh, more than a year. That's why a lot of people are looking at second half 2023. Uh, around June 2023 is when they actually anticipate um, when we start bottoming out, uh, according to all the structural bear markets that happened in history. So um, Timothy Peterson said that in the six-month period where in September 08 to March 2009, in just six months, there were already 20 days, 16 days with 4% plus gains. However, these first 13 preceded lower lows. So what he is saying is that um, there are significant 4 or 5% days, daily gains, but actually it drops. So here, then it drops. It went up, it dropped, up, up, then drop, up, up, then drop, up, drop, up, up, drop, up, drop, up, drop, up. Drop. So basically, despite the very strong up day last night, it's actually part and parcel of all bear markets. Same uh, same point shared by Mark Yusko. There are no 4 or 5% up days in bull markets, none, zero. They happen in a bear market. The dot-com bust, like year 2001 to 2003, also had these 4 4% up days before it bottomed. So actually... A lot of stocks would go up and yet actually bottom out two years later at a lower low. The time between 10-3 inversion and stock market bottom, if you're also going to check the 10-year, three-month yield spread, um, you bottom out for stocks 6 to 24 months after the spread goes negative. So far though, we are here. Um, it's... a uh, it only inverted but 10 months after the bear market started. So a realistic estimate for a bottom is still about 5 to 14 months out. So the earliest that most people who are trying to bottom out using the last couple of 40, 50 years or 100 years, they're, uh, they're trying to infer when the inverted yield curve would actually provide the stock market bottom. The earliest, they say, is about May 2023 or... Um, Somewhere in 2024, May 2023 till 2024, somewhere there you do get a bottom. So this is also your volatility index. Take note that in recent times, we do have extreme fear always happening here. That's why around uh, October 16, we did buy the bottom of S&P 500, short-term bottom at about 3536. That was October 16. However, last night's rally tells us that the Volti S&P 500 index is actually near the complacent zone. Every time you've got the VIX actually trading 24 to 18, that is complacency. That was the market peaks. August 16 to August, August 23, this was your S&P 500 at 4.3 to 4.2, 4 4.1. Your March and April zones, this was actually your S&P 500 at 4.5, 4.6. Your uh, here around January, wherein your S and P 500 was at 46, 47, 48, where everyone was still complacent that the market's not gonna fall despite Fed uh, saying that they would hike rates. This has been opportunistic times to actually add into the shorts and to hold the shorts. So we are actually in the complacency zone, and we are also in the greed fear, uh, in the greed zone. Nowadays, stocks are skewing returns. Net new 52-week highs against lows on the New York Stock Exchange. As you can see, we are starting back towards uh, many uh, greed, greed, uh, greed uh, phase and extreme greed happening when it comes to stock price breadth, as many names last night rose against decline. Now, this is your SQQQ, which we are sharing uh, in December 2021. Let's say the markets continue to rally from current uh, 3,950 to 42. We, di we do can see two, full, uh, two downturns that can happen. 47 can drop to 40 or it can drop to 30. So if you can handle a 15% or a 30% down move, considering last night it already felt 20%, then these are the, the, the next scenarios in case your SQQQ continues to fall. And that means your TQQQs, uh, which is uh, the short covering rally, how high can it go? After rallying 20% up last night, can it go up further? From 21, there seems to be another rally towards 25 or 30 if you will check maximum pain. But that's maximum pain uh, to look at. Now, Apple, which is obviously your NASDAQ uh, biggest uh, sentiment mover, uh, you've got NASDAQ 
still uh, from current oversold level from about 136, it rallied to 147. Let's assume maximum pain that Apple can continue going higher. It can go up 6%, which means that your uh, SQQQs can still fall 20% from here, from about 47 last night to about either 40 or 30s. So that's your Apple. This is your Amazon. Can it rally after a 12% rally last night? A gap fill here at 110 is 14% for, a, for an Amazon. Microsoft, uh, back to the downtrend line here from two, rallied last night 8% from 230s to 240s. Uh, looking at maximum pain, uh, watch out whether Microsoft will get uh, rejected at 270 or less than that. We're looking at maximum pains. So when it comes to maximum pain, your SOX is here at 37. We've seen how it fell towards $30, so another 20% just in case for maximum pain. Um, your SQQQ can go to uh, from 46 to 30. So, so far, we haven't seen them actually drop to 30s, but uh, something to take uh, to, to just mind the, mind the doubt in case. Uh, for your uh, gold, yes, they've been rallying, uh, so gold bears. Um, but I think the more relevant for us fundamentally is more in the uh, semiconductors and the fangs, the, fa uh, the technology names and your indices. Uh, growth stocks usually are still uh, at huge downtrends. Uh, FAS, uh, which is your banks, have maybe a leeway to go another 5 to 10% to the upside, which means probably $17 for FAS can go down towards 15 so here, let's take a look at your QC yet again, 280 in case we have another additional rally towards 310, courtesy of Apple, Amazon, Tesla, and the likes. Then just prepare for SQQQ to potentially drop towards 30s, 35, but uh, just be patient because uh, we will, of course, watch out for how low these uh, inverse funds will go. So semiconductor bears here at $30 area, so just 20% leeway to go. That has been supported for the last uh, couple of months. Uh, obviously, the risk here is what NVIDIA will report next week, although all, almost all of them have been reporting negative guidance and lower income for the year. Now, some contagion risk to take note of. BlockFi, uh, of course, uh, is uh, also insolvent now, much like Ku KuCoin, uh, QCoin and OKCoin, they are uh, they do have a lot of exposure with the bankruptcy of FTX, and uh, a lot of this fear will be a contagion. Crypto crash is now being seen as gonna be a stock market crash and a housing crash. So Mt. Gox, uh, Terra Luna, FTX would tether be next, another big potential implosion. So uh, really, I think the markets are already in crash mode capitulation and. Um, these are also a few news to take a look at. As crypto exchange has ballooned in size, you've got uh, FTX raising money from Paradigm, SoftBank, Sequoia. Um, those uh, funds like the Massec, Tiger Global, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, all of them have put uh, at least a billion dollars and uh, raised a billion dollars. And so these investors are, are losing out with one billion gone. Uh, an Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, this is in Canada, they lost $100 million from this uh, fallout in FTX. Buffett's Berkshire, another thing to note of, uh, Berkshire Hathaway usually does not sell. So when they do, uh, we do take a look at that. They did share uh, that they shed more than 91 million U.S. Bank of Corp shares. Berkshire Hathaway has also been selling the BYD 1211 stake uh, in China. So... Um, in, in other news, Tom Brady was also caught in the FTX fallout. Um, he is losing a complete strategic investment. Uh, uh, he already had a divorce this year, a wipeout in FTX. It's really been a rough uh, year for the seven-time Super Bowl champion. Um, we are climbing a wall of worry, but we are setting a stage for another big leg down. A lot of the people are uh, sour graping on what happened with FTX. Take note that 3AC co-founder Chu Su uh, after uh, said that um, surfing the wave of waves and then next moment wiped out. Take note that um, FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, lost his entire practical wealth from $15, $15 billion uh, dollar net worth in just a single day. Uh, supposedly, Bloomberg said that he's now just uh, $919 million worth 
but maybe he he isn't even worth a billion. He might be uh, losing more than that with a lot of liabilities and lawsuits to come. So, um, yeah, so a lot of uh, bearish uh, market movements in the entire market. And um, I would share that uh, this, uh, this implosion happening in the market is not something to poo-poo upon. Nonetheless, um, it doesn't get rid of the risks that are happening in your inverse funds in a lot of shorts. Um, perception is that we could continue to rally, but uh, I would say that for better sleeping at night, there's really twofold. I think that you, you sleep better with cash, or I still believe I sleep better with some shorts. So that's it, and hope that you have a good weekend, and see you again next week for another um, market update in the world. Bye-bye.